again. I'm Sue Swinand, and welcome to another half hour of Arts and Ideas. I'm delighted to have two very distinguished artists with me today, a husband and wife team, Alan, who is a poet and writer, and uh, Nan Hossfeldman, who uh, is a visual artist. And um, thank you for inviting us into your home. It's quite a nice experience to be here and be able to uh, wallow in all this <laughs> color and <laughs> wonderful <laughs> environment. And I think it's uh, significant too because I think your, your environment and your family is really reflected in your, in your work, both of you. Sure. So, uh, so it's nice to be here. No, thank you. Um, I wanted to give a little background. Alan has received numerous fellowships including National Endowment for the Humanities, uh, Massachusetts Artist Fellowship, um, National Endowment for the Arts. Radcliffe Institute uh, named you Distinguished Instructor in Writing in 2000 also, which is very nice. Um, and his most recent collection of poems, A Sail to Great Island, was awarded the 2004 Felix Pollock Prize in Poetry. But in addition, he's been published in all the big magazines, Atlantic Monthly, New Yorker, uh, The Nation. So, uh, and Nan, she uh, has a list four pages long. <laughs> <laughs> She's won the uh, Roddy Memorial Prize numerous times, the Arts Worcester Biennial Prize. She's had several Kinnicut travel grants. And top that off, she's had over 40 one-person shows in her uh, magnificent career. So, uh, Thank you. so, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm so happy to have you both here. I thought maybe you could start by talking a little bit about your uh, history in teaching which is a big part of your life. Sure. Yes, it is. And, and uh, as I was telling you, the, the very first conversation that Nan and I ever had um, on October 31st, 1970, Halloween. Halloween, we met at a Halloween party. This must party. be significant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, had to do with the combination of, of, of teaching and creative work because we both, by coincidence, had taught at uh, arts camps for teenagers and there were only three of them at that time in the United States. And Nan taught at Lincoln Farm and I taught at Shaker Village. And so we met and we immediately started to talk about how creative art and the teaching of the creative arts um, synergized as opposed to, you know, taking away from each other, which I think yes. is what many artists feel that when they have to teach, they, they resent it. It takes time That's away. True. Yeah, yeah. But I think for us, uh, our conversation, and we've kept this conversation going for almost 40 years, has been how these um, ways of being in the world really um, um, energize each other. They're both ways of giving your creativity you know, to the world, but, but um, one is very interpersonal and the other is very solitary, but they, but they seem to work yes. well for both of us. I find know. the interaction mm -hmm. with the student students very stimulating yeah. in most yeah. cases. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you, were, uh, you have a history of teaching. I think you started at the uh, Danforth. Right. I started. I actually started my one full-time <laughs> job of my entire life was a, as, as an art teacher at the Brophy Elementary School, uh, 1972. And then um, shortly after that, um, we, we had been married, and then I got pregnant. And um, when my daughter was born, um, our daughter was born in uh, December 1973, I got involved with um, ten people. I was one of the ten uh, to talk about starting a museum. It was really Paul Marx's idea, Paul and Elaine Marx. Um, so uh, I got involved. Which was the Danforth. Which, which was and is the now the, became yeah, the, became Danforth, the Danforth Museum. So I started really there in 1973, um, and then it evolved to. Um, and you were the first art teacher, and I was kidding you that you yeah. had 150 students in the first class. <laughs> yeah, 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 56 in the first class. Uh, we had no idea what to expect, and and it and it was very popular, and and still is, luckily, all these mm -hmm. years later. Mm -hmm. And so, and that evolved into. Um, then starting teaching at the Worcester Art Museum, which I which I love, and um, and then at the De Cordova, and um, so I. So you've been teaching at three museums yeah. for the better part of thirty-seven years. Mm. Yes, and, uh, <laughs> that's about, true. That's yeah. true. And 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 I love it. You said the, you know, how does it sort of mix with the doing your own, your own work? And um, fortunately, I I mean I have been lucky that I've been able to teach, part time where I want, and then do my work, you know, simultaneously and 
they really influence and feed off each other. Yeah, yeah. Um, they're positive to each other. They, they don't right. take away from each other. Alan, I wanted to, um, you know, being a teacher who has interacted so much with students, is there something that you really try to get across to students mm. about mm. what poetry can mean for them or some significant idea that you try to convey? I, I think what I'm always teaching, and I, I bet in her way Nan is teaching the same thing, is that your creative work has to involve your whole brain. Mm. Uh, your emotions, your thoughts, your intellect, um, your history, your, your mm. autobiography, um, so that um, if, if my students are able to put themselves into a kind of free-fall mentality where they trust that their mind will um, will engage all of its parts and all the parts of their lives and, and thinking and feeling, then, then their work will be rich and it will be them. And uh, so that requires sometimes a lot of, of working with them on creating occasions for spontaneity and for... Mm -hmm. um, and for following intuition. Yes, yeah. and trusting that. Yes. Trusting accident. I, I'm going to yeah, mention this. So. Uh, yeah. I, I just read a little poem by uh, Billy Collins, mm -hmm. and it was about teaching poetry to mm. the first the introduction to poetry. Mm -hmm. And he said the students like to put the poem in a chair and tie it up with ropes <laughs> and beat it with hoses <laughs> and interrogate it until it yeah. gives its meaning. You yes. know, yes. and and somehow you can't do that. You know, you have to let the poem just come with. Well. Uh, yeah, I mean that's if you're if you, but but I think if you if you're reading a poem, you can't spend too much time uh, thinking about all the things that it's doing. But when you're writing a poem, it's almost the opposite that you have to um, sometimes work fast because there's so much self-censoring yes. that can that yes. can block you know maybe the ugly things you want to say or the weird things you want to say. Self-censoring. That's really interesting. So you have to let it just come. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. You know, I read on your website a, a quote of Philip Gustin. Oh, yes. That blew my socks off. I mm. And uh, I want to read it because I, 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 I don't want to share it. <laughs> you want to say it yourself by heart? Go ahead. Because yeah, um, it, it means so much to me. <coughs> um, it's, I think, uh, if when I, you're I in the studio. W yeah, when you're in the studio, one by one, each of your friends, your family, people from art history, uh, go and probably more than that, go in with you um, into the studio. And when you're really painting, one by one, each of them walks out. And when you're really painting, when you're really, 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 really painting, painting, you walk out. <laughs> and and if I read that originally years ago, <coughs> it did blow my mind too because. I have such vivid, vivid memories of being in the studio, and this is not once, but like many, many times, you know, like hundreds of times even, um, where I, I just, I, I can almost feel my body leave, and my, just my, my being is in the painting. I mean, I'm totally unaware of myself. I mean, it's I like love that feeling. It's like your vehicle. It's just like your it's vehicle, like vehicle that throw, flows through you. Yes, and usually uh, it's, um, there's usually music on, for me, there's usually uh, jazz or some music that has meaning to me, and I get so into the music, and I get into whatever visually I'm doing, and then it's sort of, it's just this wonderful state of being that is timeless. You have no sense of time. You're outside yourself. Yeah, yeah. And, and that, of course, that doesn't always happen. Yeah. But it, it, it is a wonderful, um, yeah. I think, true statement that um, it's such a wonderful feeling to lose yourself and and you're creating and and, um, and at the same time be your essential self. Be your essential self. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because that, you're not censoring. Yeah. That's no, it. Not you're censoring. just doing. Not it's censoring. like it's flowing through you. Uh, yeah. I really like that idea. Yeah, yeah. Um, Alan, would you uh, be willing to read us a poem or oh, two? Sure. I'd love to hear sure. some of your work and. Also, you can see a lot of Alan's work online if you go and look up Alan Feldman. There are lots, lots of poems yeah. to read there. Yes. Alan Feldman poems. <laughs> um, well, you know what? Since we're talking about um, the conversation among the arts here, or between yeah. the arts, um, 
why don't I why don't I read a a short poem about uh, Van Gogh, a little sonnet. It's called Self Portrait. Near the door, Van Gogh's face glows like a moon, an aura of green light mm -hmm. centered on the right eye. A mud-colored impasto coat, lapels of electric blue, a purple clot near his collar. It's not a tie or a flower. Maybe it's meant to be a brooch or an unhealed wound. If we start with the button on his vest, move up to the eyes, we approach the man as a constellation. Whatever he suffers can't be personal. Forehead like a headlight, he stares at us, steady, pale green. You perish, he tells us, broadcasting his single frequency message. What matters is that everything blazes away to its dust in pain. Take it from me or my green wall. You're born, trees wave their wild arms, and that's all. <laughs> I wrote that uh, in the museum, wow, looking at that painting. Wow. And I it noticed that all the brush strokes radiated from one eye in that painting. You can't see wow. it in reproductions, but it's just like radio signals coming out from a transmitter. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Now yeah. that seems like such a dark, uh, you know, you're born, you, 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 but at least the trees waved. <laughs> well, no, there's nothing. There's it's nothing. Just the way it is. It's nothing is supposed to be optimistic about that. <laughs> about that poem, yeah. Except it's I guess the optimism is that an artist can affect you so powerfully, you yeah. know, can engage you so it's powerfully. It's just such a juxtaposition with Nan's work, which is such a celebration. That's why everything. I read it. Yeah. I just want you to think. You know, I don't want you to think we're we're both saying the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> but However, also, don't take her work as being merely optimistic. She yeah. can fool you. If you yeah. look at her paintings carefully, there can be some very weird and even dark things that are yeah. woven in to keep yeah. the paintings intelligent. Yeah. 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 And and th and actually, there's a, there's a lot of work that people don't always see that that it has a, actually a very dark side. Mm -hmm. It's always about. Mm -hmm. Me, yeah. you know, what's going well, on you in my know, mind, you have to yeah. have. I always yeah. thought you needed to have some things from the dark side of our humanity, yeah. in yeah. order. It, it's like uh, in, in order to appreciate the light things. Yeah, yeah. Because if everything is light all the oh, time, absolutely. you could mm -hmm. be a little nauseated. Yeah. You know? I think yeah. the yeah. reason that people treasure poetry is because it gives them permission to think the thoughts that the culture says are not good to think. And to go to um, places American culture is, is programmatically optimistic. We're yeah. the greatest nation in the world. Mm. Um, the future is always going to be better. And, and poetry is a terrific counterweight to that, that um, mm -hmm. deadening force of optimism that, that, that just yeah. chases um, and uh, that puts so many a thoughts veneer out of people's that heads. That sometimes puts a veneer over yeah. everything. And, and yeah. people suffer for that. Mm -hmm. So the poem is a place where, you know, as I say, you can experience the full mind, including mm -hmm. the dark thoughts that, mm -hmm. that um, you know, it's not really permissible mm -hmm. to, to talk mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. yeah. Could we have another? Sure. This is all, uh, about another art. This one's about music, and this is um, Bill Evans. Oh. Um, I was listening to um, that wonderful melody that Bill Evans plays, Never Let Me Go. Dum da 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 dum, da 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 dum, da 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 dum. Bill Evans plays "Never Let Me Go." Never let me go, says the piano, when the five syllables are repeated a little lower, maybe more sadly, or with more acceptance, that this plaint is endless, fruitless, but it is the plaint of love forever, whatever else changes. And the five notes always sound different, the way the lover constantly is finding new ways to ask what can't be answered. The piano takes a break to think it over, all around the keyboard, as if it is free to take a walk anywhere away from those five notes. But no, it's been walking towards them. Never let me go, it says cheerfully, tenderly, without reproach, as if it knows that saying so is its true calling. Mm. So that's my response to, to, his, to his music. Nice to have the uh, connections to the music and the visual, the Van Gogh. 
Um, they both, they all have an energy, actually. Mm -hmm. It's so much, when you were just reading the, p the, the two poems, you know, when I think of Van Gogh, and, 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 and obviously his, his work has a, a certainly a, a dark and troubled side, and his work is also loved, universally loved. I think it's because of that outrageous sort of humanity and, and, and emotion that's raw. Yeah. And people can relate to, and and whether it's whether th whether the images are, or the the poem or, or the music is um, upbeat or sad, it's so human. <laughs> it's and you it's so you love it even though it's dark relatable. because you relatable. know you're alive yes, when you look right. at it. Yeah. You know right. it's uh, yeah. So anyway, um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your. I know. Well, a couple things. One thing is I know you've done some collaboration. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah. I wanted to uh, show these these chapbooks that you've published, which are combinations of poetry and visual, the, the paintings of Van. Yeah. So, uh, sure, maybe you could hold one, too. Okay. And um, <laughs> these were done on your travels. Yes, uh, that's Mexico. This is France. And the way we work together... <laughs> as I write my poems, and and Nan does her artwork. She doesn't illustrate, um, and I don't actually. I think very rarely do I write about Europe paintings, Sometimes, not but often. we just do our thing. But what I asked her to do was just to make um, uh, anything she wanted uh, a certain size, a certain <laughs> size, <laughs> and you <laughs> almost got it right. But it was about that, and she did about thirty different, very very colorful um, collage drawings. And, and I just picked five, uh, well, I picked six of them, one for the cover and five inside to fit the sections of the book. That were appropriate. That yeah. were appropriate, yeah. yeah. Now, this one, you said, was done uh, in uh, Zocala. Uh, no, no, that, that's, that was the, um, uh, about our visit to Oaxaca in Mexico. Okay. And the Zocalo, of course, is the center of oh, the yes, town. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So that's called On the Zocalo. And that one we did uh, to raise money for a wonderful organization, Oaxaca Street Children. Grassroots. Uh, grassroots. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, education is free in Mexico, but you need to have money to buy shoes and to buy books. And lunch. And, and lunch. lunch. And this organization, uh, run by expatriate Americans down there in Oaxaca, uh, raises money that enables um, uh, uh, dozens if not hundreds of children to uh, attend school. And mm. we actually visited them yeah. uh, mm. the last time we were yeah. in Oaxaca oh, and saw wonderful? the children. Yeah, was, so yeah, we had so terrible. much fun. I am not a self-promoter, but when we did that booklet, I felt as though I had become national public radio. And I was like, <laughs> saying, now don't forget to buy the chapbook <laughs> for the children, because it wasn't about me anymore yeah. Yeah. or yes, about yes, us. Yes, yes. It and was we, about you know doing something for, uh, for others. And uh, I think it was a terrific use of our... Uh, Yes. Of our artwork. Now, yeah. Nan, when you begin works, I notice most of these are interiors or landscapes seem to be your favorite yeah. uh, subjects. Do you paint on site or? Um, over the how years, do you do that? Over the years, it's evolved. Um, interesting, coming back to um, uh, interiors, when, when I started in 1972, 73, after getting out of college, and, um, I, and then I had my daughter and my son, I did interiors because I was home. So it started with interiors 35 years ago. Then I went on to other things, um, and I used to work do collages and all kinds of ways. But since 1999, um, it seems like I know that date because that's the date that um, I started using um, these sort of water-based oils, even though there's no water in it. Um, and I started teaching in Europe. So all of a sudden, I um, abandoned, in a way, um, how I would get ready for doing my own work, and I started just sketching um, with a piece of charcoal, a kneaded eraser, and a can of fixative, um, which has been three <laughs> times confiscated on airplanes. Um, <laughs> but um, those three things, that's it. And so I would, and since I have an astigmatism, <laughs> um, I don't see straight lines. So I, I sketch, and I generally put anything I want into a work. So I'm doing this room, and I decide I want something in that room in it, and something from over there, and something over there. And so I just put it in. Um, and I have to have a line which defines the composition. And that's it. I always that's try it. to emphasize that to students. That's start it. with the good structure. Start with the bones yeah, yeah. of the painting. That's and exactly if you get right. that, then yeah. you can let your imagination take flight with pattern and texture and color. And yeah. So that's really what you're doing it's, is it's drawing. A, it's exactly what I'm doing. So you don't use photographs? No, I don't. I, photographs are flat. And um, as David Hockney said, um, you don't see 
in a frame. A frame. You see right here. That's how yeah. I draw. I, I, I don't, you know, our eyes move, and that's how my painting is to me. I, yeah. It's moving. So um, your works are very, uh, even though they're very stable structures, like rooms, and yeah. they're, they're very fluid and rhythmic and moving, I think. Thank you. Well, I mean, that comes out of the sketch. Mm -hmm. And then what's fun about it is, so I, I know that I have this composition. I do it on paper, because if, especially if I'm traveling different places, and then I trace it, and then I transfer it. So I can actually work on the paper and on these boxes, um, cradle gesso boards. Um, but I can do that and do that and do that, so I end up with all these works ready to go with a line. No photograph, no color, nothing. No additional information. And then the fun part is just starting to paint it, because it's structure, and then the rest is totally made it up. It gives you totally a little up. form to hang your brushwork and your emotion and your pleasures That's right, on. and it's totally exciting yeah. because I don't know what colors I'm going to choose. I yeah. don't know what the end result will look so like. So it's always going to be fresh. I don't know what the patterns are going to be. Yes. It's always going to be fresh because you're not a slave to a photograph. Yes, and I don't get, I used to get nervous when I worked with this one. Now it's like I can't wait to work on them. Mm -hmm. Um, this one is an acrylic painting, and um, uh, it was done uh, uh, differently than the ones that, that I do on oil, which are flat. This is done on an easel and with big brushes, and um, it sort of came about, all these sort of more gestural acrylic paintings came about, um, I think when I went back for my um, MFA, uh, Master of Fine Arts degree, because I wanted to unlearn all the details of knowing what I was going to do. So, so. Well, this one is a lot looser when I looser. look at the size of yeah. the brush strokes. It looks like you're using a giant brush, and I love all this wild gestural uh, activity and turbulence in the sky. It's very expressive. And, and this one actually got partially half done with my hands. I oh, just that right? abandoned the brushes, and I just, I was listening to Keith Jarrett you went like on the radio and uh, on the my boombox. One possessed. One possessed. Yeah, this is one of those ones where myself walked out, <laughs> walked out of the the studio, um, and I loved doing um, these paintings that actually had a darker side, um, but were definitely more gestural and more immediate, and and definitely not planned. This one is delightful. We're we're standing right by this table in the dining room and. Uh, I'm seeing all the familiar features around the room. It's uh, it's it's really another way of experiencing this this place, but somehow it it fits, you know. <laughs> well, this this is uh, obviously this is my dining room, um, and I have done this dining room in I would say close to about twelve paintings from different angles, and um, I wasn't into standing high or low. I just sketched it, looking at it, but in a way, it's recording. It's recording my life and where I live. Um, and, and it's like cherishing each little it object. Is, it is. It's like yeah. honoring each little yes. item. And everything has a story. I mean, many people have, you know, stories about what's in their home. But to me, every single so it's object. It's recording is, your history. Yes. Yeah. It, it's, sort of, it's sort of memorializing it, you know, yeah. that it, even when I'm maybe not living here or whatever, or years beyond. But the other thing I'd like exist. to say is that it, as much as this is all the details of the room, it's really nothing like a photograph you would take of the room. It has nothing to do with the per correct perspective. <laughs> or right. the, uh, it, it's like you're going by on a merry-go-round, you know? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it, it actually, I think, is the way that I see. I mean, I really, and I put in what I want, where I want, even though it's approximately where I see it. I never worry about is it in correct perspective. Well, you know, just um, thinking about the perspective and the stability of interior spaces, mm -hmm. which are usually flat and vertical and horizontal, look at the dynamics in this painting, the way everything is on an angle. Everything is a force thrusting and driving and flowing. It's, uh, you know, counterbalancing of energies. It's like energies are just let loose on these uh, items. It's, it's amazing. Everything else has its own little vibe going. going. Well, you know, sometimes, oh, sorry, sometimes um, people say, well, oh, they're, 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 so, they're childlike, which I, which I take as a compliment. Um, uh, you know, not to lose that wonderful joy of like creating and making things. And, and um, 
And I think that they, they, they have, these paintings have evolved after 37 years of painting. You know, so they're actually, to me, quite learned and yet totally not learned at the same mm -hmm. time. I mean, it's... You know what you were saying before about this old Gustin quote about yeah. getting out of the way? Um, there's a, the word, um, the, the word uh, that enthusiasm yeah. comes from the Greek to be in God. Ah, in Theo, yeah. and, yeah, yeah, and yeah. Uh, that, that's kind of a way of saying mm -hmm. that you're out of yourself and yeah. that you're uh, experiencing what's around you to yeah. its full uh, power. But mm -hmm. also, I like the idea that people who enjoy, and I have to say, you are a person who seems to enjoy oh, everything. I do. I do. To me, that's a way, it's almost like worship. Yeah. You know, because you you appreciate every little thing. You mm -hmm. you uh, take all of its flavor. You you know you, it, it, you recognize it. You see it. I see it, and I love and it. Therefore, and therefore, that's it. a way <laughs> of giving giving some kind of honor to the to the world we live in. And you know, well, I, in a way, to me, it's like worship. Well, that's that is interesting that you say that. I mean, I don't necessarily think of it that way or not. I think of it as like. Um, living my life to the fullest, enjoying it, appreciating it, making it last, um, being so happy to be alive, and but and one surround way, myself. But to see things, to yeah. see things, and and the, see their wonder. Yes, yeah. You know, I guess see that's the wonder true. of common things is part of it, and enjoy that. I'm afraid we're going to have to stop there, yeah. and I'm going to say thank you so much to uh, both of you for uh, having us here today. It's been a wonderful experience. And I hope to see you again next time on Arts and Ideas.